in contemplating the causes which may disturb our union. It occurs as a matter of serious concern that any ground should have been furnished for characterizing parties by geographical discriminations. Northern and Southern, Atlantic and Western. Whence designing men may endeavor to excite a belief that there is a real difference of local interests and views. One of the expedients of party to acquire influence within particular districts is to misrepresent the opinions and aims of other districts. You cannot shield yourselves too much against the jealousies and heartburnings which spring from these misrepresentations. They tend to render alien to each other those who ought to be bound together by fraternal affection. All combinations and associations, under whatever plausible character, serve to organize faction, to give it an artificial and extraordinary force, to put in the place of the delegated will of the nation the will of a party. And according to the alternate triumphs of different parties, to make the public administration the mirror of the ill-concerted and incongruous projects of faction, rather than the organ of consistent and wholesome plans digested by common councils and modified by mutual interests. However combinations or associations of the above description may now and then answer popular ends, they are likely, in the course of time and things, to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. I have already intimated to you the danger of parties in the state, with particular reference to the founding of them on geographical discriminations. Let me now take a more comprehensive view and warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party generally. This spirit, unfortunately, is inseparable from our nature, but in those of the popular form it is seen in its greatest rankness and is truly their worst enemy. The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge natural to party dissension, is itself a frightful despotism. The habits of thinking in a free country should inspire caution in those entrusted with its administration to confine themselves within their respective constitutional spheres, avoiding in the exercise of the powers of one department to encroach upon another. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments in one and thus to create, whatever the form of government, a real despotism. A just estimate of that love of power and proneness to abuse it. The necessity of reciprocal checks in the exercise of political power by dividing and distributing it into different depositaries and constituting each the guardian of the public wheel against invasions by the others. The nation which indulges towards another an habitual hatred is in some degree a slave. 
it is a slave to its animosity, of which is sufficient to lead it astray from its duty and its interest. How many opportunities do they afford to tamper with domestic factions, to practice the arts of seduction, to mislead public opinion, to influence or all the public councils? In offering to you, my countrymen, these counsels of an old and affectionate friend, I dare not hope they will make the strong and lasting impression I could wish, that they will control the usual current of the passions, or prevent our nation from running the course which has hitherto marked the destiny of nations that they may now and then recur to moderate the fury of party spirit, to warn against the mischiefs of foreign intrigue, to guard against the impostures of pretended patriotism. This hope will be a full recompense for the solicitude of your welfare by which they have been dictated. The United States of North America was originally formed by a group of white men known as the Founding Fathers. They created a document that they called the Constitution of the United States, which would be known as the Supreme Law of the Land. It was a document that was designed to limit the power of the United States government in its dealings with these former colonies and especially with any of the individuals from each of these newly formed states. There is a theory extant that the nine northern-based colonies tended to be quite Anglo-Saxon in their heritage, while the four massive southern-based colonies tended to be comprised of the Celtic people and country English. But indeed, if the two sides of that battle during that time period are not strictly genealogically based as Anglo-Saxon and Celtic in their divisions, that is most certainly the way it does tend to work out in practice. The Lincolns, for example, were actually from seven generations of Massachusetts socialists, and Thomas Jefferson and his namesake Jefferson Davis were both exceedingly Welsh. This trend tends to follow the tone of the two sides politically of the white man's government in North America. An even better theory states that the fact that there is a majority of Anglo-Saxon and Germanic dominance at the North makes them more socialist, more totalitarian efficient, and more overweeningly ambitious in their beliefs and actions than those of the South, who are mostly of a Celtic and country English sort of laid-back quality-over-quantity-leisure class indolence. The point that we make from this is simple. The two divisions of these North American white men are, and have always been, two separate races, and they have at times desired two separate countries based exclusively upon these differences coming to the surface during their interactions with one another. So, how did we originally end up with two separate and distinct types of white racial ideologies in the North American continent? Classifying the origins of the white man and the white people as a race, has proven to be quite impossible. Indeed, not all Caucasians, or those people originating in the Caucasus Mountains, were ever a completely white race, nor are they white to this day. And while it is true that the only places that we find white people indigenously are in the Caucasus Mountains, as well as in a number of continental European areas, there is no one place that they are known to have originated. And while we have no real direct link between the Celts and the white Caucasians of the Caucasus Mountains, 
just south of Russia. We do have some very interesting facts about those people who most certainly formed or helped to form the original North American Southern Confederate nation and the white Southern people of the United States today. In sum, there seem to be three sets of white people who are of historical interest to us in this study. The original southern-based Caucasians, also known as Circassians. The continental and insular Celts of ancient Europe. And the white southerners of the United States of North America. There are also three sets of northern-based other white people who were most instrumental in invading these three sets of southern-based white people. And not only does history seem to repeat itself every few centuries, but it also seems to set an indelible pattern as well. Consider the following. The Slavic white people of Eastern Europe that great land mass known as Russia proper, came from the eastern white Slavs and would eventually invade the Adagi white people of Circassia, who were located in the south in the northern Caucasus Mountains. Circassia possessed two million people before the northern-based Russian massacre of the Circassians in a fight that went on during the Russian-Circassian Wars which lasted from 1763 until 1864, to just about the end of the American Civil War. A year later, Karl Marx would write Abraham Lincoln a letter congratulating him on bringing socialism, that first step towards communism, to the United States of North America by defeating the Confederate South. During World War I, Lenin's Red Army would force all of the southern people in the Caucasus to join the newly formed communist USSR. Vladimir Lenin was a disciple of Karl Marx, the father of communism, and Marx was, of course, the pen pal fan of Abraham Lincoln. So the Circassians and the other Caucasians tried to fight off the invading Russians from the north and became part of Russia. Then in 1917, as they were already under the Tsar's rulership, they formed the White Armies as they were attacked by Vladimir Lenin's communist Bolsheviks, or the Red Army. These northern invaders called themselves the Russian Social Democratic Party. They immediately changed their name to the Communist Party, after seizing power in the October Revolution of 1917. The White Armies were defeated in 1921, even though the United States actually helped them somewhat in their fight against the Communists. The Circassians and the Northern Caucasian people would finally get their freedom from left-wing communism of the USSR in 1991 with the final collapse of the Soviet Union. Thus ends our study of the first group of white people. So we have a northern-based totalitarian collectivist group of white Slavic people, the Russians, who are invading and conquering their southern-based white countrymen for the purposes of preserving a union dedicated to the continuation of left-wing propaganda and socialist communist ideology.
There were two sets of white Celtic peoples, the European continental Celts, such as the Gaelic people under Vercingetorix, and the insular island Celts of the Brythonic groups, basically the Welsh, the Irish, and the Scots, from Wales, Ireland, and Scotland. From their north, in northern Denmark, a country near the Vikings, came the Jutes, who then mingled with the Germanic tribes of the Angles and the Saxons, and the three of these northern-based white people invaded and conquered. The Angles and the Saxons formed the Anglo-Saxons of today, forerunners of the modern English. Northern-based, extremely socialist in their politics, and very monarchical in their government, they sought to supplant all Celtic existence in the British Isles, and very nearly succeeded in this endeavor. The Anglo-Saxons became the English, and then became the ruling class of the area, which had always been Britain, back to the time of the Romans in 450 A.D. Today, the Welsh, the Irish, and the Scots still exist. But, as permanent attachments of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, they are four countries, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. But they are permanently welded together, it would seem. For example, the Prince of Wales can also be the King of England at the same time. It was from this group of dominating, totalitarian, Anglo-Saxon slash English, and subjugated Celtic people that the United States was originally populated. True, the English would have their own problems with their own kind. The Danes would keep sending their Vikings down to attack them, and the English would resort to paying them off in Danegeld, or money as extortion for protection racketeering. But it could not happen to anyone more deserving. It was basically a type of family feud with the English at this point. The English are, after all, as Germanic as the Danes, and some of them had even been Jutes originally. This course of payment for protection Dane Guild was an accepted feature of Anglo-Saxon totalitarian life, and we even see an example of this in the United States under Abraham Lincoln. His invasion of the Charleston Harbor nearly five months after South Carolina announces the resumption of her independence was a textbook case of this activity. Most historians agree that Lincoln was there to provoke a fight out of South Carolina and indirectly force the Confederacy into war. But notice exactly what he did. He rubber-stamped the taking of Fort Sumter at Bayonet Point by Major Anderson's second-in-command, Abner Doubleday, and the taking of the South Carolinian workmen as temporary hostages in violation of former President Buchanan's armistice with South Carolina on that very fort. Lincoln then sent in an armada of eight warships, 26 guns, and 1,400 men to reinforce the fort. But to what purpose? Lincoln himself had sent in a Mr. Chu on April the 8th with a message that he would reinforce the fort peaceably or by force. Peaceably, if allowed to do that, and in violation of the armistice. The only thing that Lincoln could have done there in any wise peacefully was to have set up shop to begin extracting tribute from trading vessels in order to keep the United States tariffs up to their new mark of 47% on the dollar. Exacting tribute from trading vessels in a foreign country is, of course, piracy. But had the Southern Confederacy caved in to this demand and allowed the North to take what they wanted in trade, Lincoln's implication is that the South would have been allowed to exist peaceably as a separate nation that happened to pay tribute to America's Caesar, Abraham Lincoln. And that, of course, the South really could not let happen economically, whether peacefully or by force. Ah! 
Watch What Really Happened at Fort Sumter, available from Amazon.com, for the full word-for-word -word account told in their own dispatches. And that brings us to the important point of this first video. The United States of America was designed more closely to the Scottish or Celtic ideas of freedom and independence than to the Anglo-Saxon monarchical king and country ideology from which these North American colonials, North and South, committed absolute treason in their revolution, at least in the eyes of the British Anglo-Saxon Empire. The very fact that the 13 British colonies were rebelling against an Anglo-Saxon-based empire was prima facie evidence that the revolt for freedom and independence could only be obtained through a separation from the ways and control of the Anglo-Saxon empire of the British nation. And when you add the fact that a Declaration of Independence was written, as well as a Supreme Law of the Land document known as the very constitution of their beliefs, all of which were designed to control usurpation and aggrandizement by the chief magistrate, or the president, as well as the legislative and the judiciary branches, well, the entire plan precludes the presence of any king, dictator, or socialist regime from ever setting up shop within the federal government. And this was the very nature of the Founding Fathers' form of government for the United States. It was a purely libertarian ideology without the socialist forms and restraints of the northern-based blue states, the governments that they had in their own states, and which puritanically oppressive restrictions were completely lacking altogether in the framework of the southern colonies. And although the southern-based Celts had had to give up their Celtic languages when they were originally subjugated by Anglo-Saxon Britain centuries earlier, they kept the English tongue, albeit Americanizing it and southernizing it. They were now even purposely changing the spellings of certain words in order to show their defiance of the language which had been forced upon their forebears. Even the form of government that they all chose, north and south, the Celtic, Caucasian-styled, tribally clan idea of a republic was infuriating to Anglo-Saxon Great Britain, who was of that monarchical Anglo-Saxon totalitarian form, and had always been such as a monarchy. For if the North won the war, then England could always smile quietly to herself that she had been right all along, that the Celtic system of freedom established by the Welsh trader Thomas Jefferson and his colonial southern ilk, had indeed perished from the earth. The U.S. Constitution has its roots in the Magna Carta Libertatum that was forced upon King John by his barons at Runnymede in 1215. Many of the ideas in the Magna Carta are around today, such as the right to due process, which is found in our Sixth Amendment. Unfortunately, most if not all of the Magna Carta was repealed until, by 1969, only three actual clauses are still in effect. Indeed, our own U.S. Constitution has also suffered from such usurpations by something known as the American political party system over the years, and to such a degree that its original intent is directly threatened with extinction. The problem that both of these documents has faced in usage is the counterattack of those centralizing agencies in each country. The monarchy in England and the rise of the American socialists in the United States. The American left have relied upon their most invasive system to date, that egregious invention known as the American political party system. It keeps the country divided in half at all times, and it replaces the Constitution with a mob rules democracy. And the first successful implementation of this practice led to the deaths of at least 700,000 Americans.
The United States was created by white men who, at the time, had actually been loyal British subjects, living in one of the thirteen separate and independent colonies. Other European men wanted to rule North America as well, such as the French and the Spanish. These countries each owned up to a third of North America at any one time prior to the formation of the U.S. government. The federal government was created as an experiment of these white British colonists after they gained their independence from England. The idea was to make the world's first truly representative republic. It was not supposed to be a majoritarian mob rules democracy. In order for it to keep from becoming a mob rules democracy, the founders crafted the document known as the Constitution to govern the new constitutional republic and to make sure that no king, no dictator, nor any communist regime, nor any political party could have its way with the nation once any of these persons might find themselves in the seat of power in the general government. The Founding Fathers did not plan to create a government for the implied benefit of the impoverished, nor for the enforced governmental equalization of every one of its tax-paying and non-tax-paying citizens, and every one of its non-tax-paying illegal alien trespassers, nor for the benefit nor advancement of every other race upon the earth and their individual country situated thousands of miles from the North American continent. Just as Africa, China, and the other racially defined countries of the earth gave the white colonials in North America absolutely no concern about white rights within their borders, so the original white founding fathers had no plans for any such things within their constitutional framework, and they were indeed intent upon denying anyone who might come to power that ability to enforce such a tyranny upon the several states with their Jewish prudence. Illegal aliens would be deported. End of story. There would be no protected classes of people save for one, that of the white male landowners, who were the only ones who were supposed to have anything to do with the federal government at all. As for the white women, their children, the indentured servants, and the slaves, these all belonged to the white male landowner who was also known as the master, and they all had his last name as their own. He had branded each of them with his name, thus giving them the legitimacy to exist within the state and not be seen as illegitimate, illegally present, nor vagabonds and vagrants. As for the women who were not married, they belonged to their fathers and kept his last name as his own property and legitimacy, just like their mothers did. Lesbian relationships were not legal and therefore were illegitimate, as were all homosexual relationships. In fact, they were crimes against decency and against the state and were punishable as such. The fact that the white male also had to own land was most indicative of his social legitimacy. For the only reason that one owned land or received any land prior to a father's death was to continue his master's family line in the same name to be fruitful and multiply. The American political party system, on the other hand, is a blatantly unconstitutional activity designed to make sectional politics a major factor in each federal election. By definition, politics is a derogatory activity. It is the debate or conflict among individuals or parties having or hoping to achieve power. It is power for the sake of power and nothing else. It was feared by the Founding Fathers above all else. And in the words of Benjamin Franklin, he said that we had been given a republic if we could keep it. Unfortunately, we could not keep it. We lost our republic to the American political party system, and we thus degraded into a second-class democracy, politically ignoring all of the constitutional restraints that we could get by with ignoring and misinterpreting in the name of party politics. 
The American political party system was created by that group of men who were not at all pleased with the constitutional form of government that they had been obliged to vote for in order to create the United States of America. The great majority of these men were from the nine small northern colonies, and they feared that the four massive southern colonies would do what the north would do were they in that position of a foreseeable majority ascendancy. That is, to run completely roughshod over the other states in a bid for absolute federal power. The problem was in their background and in their thinking. The nine eastern or northern colonies, as they were called later, were mostly Anglo-Saxon, London-based Englishmen who were used to living on top of each other, getting into each other's business, and were descended from the Puritanical fathers who made it their business to know everything about everyone in their communities. Like an alarming number of white men the world over, these were a group of socialists, communists, and petty tin-pot god dictators in their own small societies. They were displaced English monarchists and Anglo-men, as Thomas Jefferson called them, wanting to take us back into the colonial condition, which is why they were calling themselves New England. Today, they are known as the Blue States. In sum, the United States Constitution is a protective document created expressly for the purpose of denying undesired monarchy, dictatorship, and socialism in the United States of America. The Northeastern colonies have long thought it an agreement with death and a covenant with hell because it diametrically opposed their whole way of life both as colonies and as states. The Constitution does not actually forbid monarchy, dictatorship, nor American socialism if every state in the Union is in agreement to change the government to any of those forms. The Constitution just protects any states who wish to remain sovereign, independent, and those who wish to continue to be free of such things as the American socialism of the modern-day blue state liberals. The problem with the American political party system is this. It relies not upon amendment nor anything even remotely constitutional. It merely makes a statement, passes a law in Congress and the Senate, is signed by a president, is fawned over by a favorable, adoring judiciary, and then expects that a majority will follow it, and a minority will then be forced to accept it unconditionally. And this is the unconstitutionality of the American political party system. It is the executive of a mob rules democracy, and it is not the representative republic that the colonies all ratified when they decided to become states in a compact of union. And this is the reason why the United States of America has always been divided in half. Since the American Civil War, every major conflict we have been involved in has been to help some southern-based group of people fight off a northern-based, totalitarian, usually communist, collectivist government bent upon the subjugation of their southern countrymen. Sarajevo was to the south of Austria in World War I. Austria was to the south of Nazi Germany, World War II. Taiwan is to the south of China in the Chinese Civil War. South Korea is to the south of Communist North Korea in the Korean conflict. South Vietnam is to the south of Communist North Vietnam in the Vietnam police action. The Falklands are to the south of Argentina. Kuwait is to the south of Iraq.
Whether or not you actually believe in a karmic cycle for the nations, the facts remain that the victorious northern government in the Civil War has had to continually fight for the rights of southern governments the world over against their hostile northern left-wing collectivist liberal blue state socialist communist counterparts. For Confederate Pictures, I'm George Wills. Thank you.